Dr. Jay Kumar, your happiness professor, is a renowned public speaker and thought leader whose expertise spans brain science, behavioral health, economics, politics, culture, and religion. He holds a master's degree in international political economy from Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs. Over the years, Dr. J has shared his powerful insights and proven strategies for happiness with hundreds of university students, thousands of radio listeners, and vast audiences throughout the US and international. He is also the author of Brain, Body, and Being, and is frequently featured in media stories revealing how to overcome life's challenges and how to tap into the inner power and innate potential for your happy brain. In my testimonial in his latest book, I state that perhaps one of the most important questions he poses is, what is happiness to you? Answering that question gives you a running start in discovering the secret to your happy brain that he relays in his book. Dr. J has a roomy quote in his introduction, which is one of my favorites. The wound is the place where light enters you. And now it's my great pleasure to welcome Dr. J. Kumar. When Lexi invited me to come here and speak, as she mentioned to you, sometimes the universe works in mysterious ways. I never would have known 20 years ago, I would have walked into a bookstore in San Francisco and picked up a book that was written by Lexi that happened to come to me at a very important time in my life. This book, which I now have written, Science of a Happy Brain, Thriving in the Age of Anger, Anxiety, and Addiction, hopefully passes on this idea where uh, the power of perhaps ideas and, and thought can be of value to people. Happiness professor, who wakes up or who, who decides like when they're young, I want to become a happiness professor when I grow up. Well, it wasn't a very, uh, it wasn't a, 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 you know, like a profession you just like, you know, uh, go and major in in college. I've had some really interesting experience I want to share with you today as part of this process. This is me, senior year of high school. You know, it would, raise your hand if you were a, proud, a child of the 80s. Raise your hand. Okay, big hair, right? Okay, I wish I had that hair right now. But I, I start off by saying that learning, I know this is a talk that's really kind of, that's aimed primarily for parents. Raise your hand if you're a parent. Okay, raise your hand if you're a, son, a, a child of a parent who's here. Okay, this is great. So this really is a talk aimed for parents and, and your children. And what I find as a university educator is that learning happens outside the classroom. Let me share with you a personal story. I was a product of two um, uh, medical uh, doctors, very driven, very, you know, like you're, you're gonna go to college, not just go to college, you're gonna get a master's degree, at least a PhD or an MD, it wasn't even like an option not to do, not to. Uh, president of the National Honor Society, 4.5 GPA, got into a top 10 uh, undergraduate university, uh, master's degree from, you know, Ivy League school. You know, a joke is like, I'm really a slacker at heart, but you don't really know that. But the point being is that, all of that academic rigor, all the rigors of my academic you know, um, education, uh, the drive to succeed, miserably failed to help me cope with the most devastating event of my life. At the age of 27, my mother unexpectedly died from suicide. And it is not something I ever could have anticipated. Nothing in my education equipped me to deal with the aftermath of my personal struggle with anger, anxiety, addiction, the trauma. And so, in some small way, I now want to help the next generation of our, you know, of, 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 our, of our society to be equipped with the tools that help them to thrive and succeed in life. So what I want to share with you today as parents are some of the tools and techniques that I have developed, and as I mentioned in the book Science of a Happy Brain, but also 
to help you as parents. The three new R's of education. And those three R's are not, you know, they used to be the first three R's of you know, reading, writing, arithmetic, but the new three R's of parenting and education and learning are training our children to be equipped to be ready, resilient, and reflective for the world ahead. Why is this so important? Our 20th century parenting and learning model that I grew up in and that other people, I think you know all of us here as parents probably, um, uh, you know, grew up in, it's not working. It's, 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 it's not allowing our kids to thrive in a 21st century world. And so why is this so crucial? I'm gonna share with you an alarming statistic as, as parents, this is something very important to, to be aware of. In the past 10 years, the increase in suicide rates for children aged 10 to 25 has increased 56% in the United States. The rate for depression for children aged 10 to 25 has increased 64%. As an educator, as parents, the question we should be asking ourselves, why is this happening? If we pride ourselves of living in a society that advances, being, you know, having uh, all these opportunities and giving our children the best, what is it really, uh, does, what does it really mean if our children are taking their own lives or are becoming more prone to depression and anxiety? And so, what I'm hoping we can maybe talk about today, and there will be time for Q&A at the end of, the, of, the, of this presentation, is to reveal some of these new strategies, but also to expose the three, what I call the three falsehoods, and to reveal to you the three truths that I believe can help us as educators and parents to help our children thrive in school and in life. Let me share with you something about the brain. As Lexi mentioned, I study the brain. I want to share with you something very remarkable about brain science. We have learned more about the human brain in the past 10 years than we have in the past 1,000 years. And that is all due to the advancements in medical technology. We can now examine and study and investigate the brain in real time in the past, we had to rely on autopsies or postmortem. The one thing that we're discovering, I'm gonna show you more about the brain science later, but one thing we're discovering that we know about the brain, during the ages, up to the age of 25, the brain is still developing. We're finding that most lifelong issues with depression and anxiety or uh, mood disorders, behavioral disorders, begin or originate in this crucial age of 15 to 25. So if we can catch this early, or more importantly, if we can equip our students, our, our children, with the tools and techniques to no longer, to, to have the tools for, to be ready, resilient, and reflective, we can perhaps address this crucial endemic of the suicide and mental health crisis we're seeing in the world today. So let's talk about what these three falsehoods are and talk about the three strategies we can, as parents, as educators, we can do to, to overcome some of these issues. So the first falsehood I want you as a parent to understand is that the whole idea that failure is not an option, it doesn't work. Life is messy. We can never predict what's gonna happen. I never could have predicted uh, what would have happened to me in, for when I, in my 20s after you know, uh, graduating from college and going to grad school. I never could have predicted that. But what we're seeing is that this idea that we instill that you have to be the best, you have to get the A on your algebra test, you have to get the best school, you have to be the best on the varsity, you gotta make the varsity, if you don't, we're not gonna love you. Well, that's the, that's the impression children sometimes receive. As parents, we may not actually 
advocate that. But all of you are aware of the college admission scandal that took place this past year. It's, I think it really exposes the, uh, the powerful drive as parents. We will go to any means possible to see our kids succeed and to, and to, and to thrive in the world. But inadvertently, we also imply falsely that failure is not an option. This idea of failure, failure not being an option, it leads to a concept called pressured perfectionism. Children, I see some heads nodding from the kids here. Children feel they have to be perfect at everything. If they're not, they're no longer going to be loved or valued or feel that they have a sense of purpose or meaning. So, the pressure perfectionism is one of the first things we have to let go of as parents and understand that it's okay not to be okay. It is okay not to be okay. And for children to learn to be vulnerable, to learn to accept their frailties, and to say to our children, you are okay who you are. Life is a process. As I like to say, happiness is not a destination, it is a direction. How many of you, raise your hand, kids and parents, have ever caught yourself saying, I'll be happy when? I'll be happy when I graduate high school. I'll be happy when I get into a good college. I'll be happy when I get married. I'll be happy when I get my first job that makes six figures. I'll be happy when I retire. The goalposts keep changing. So the idea is that to understand that happiness is in the present moment. There is no happiness in the future or the converse. I was happy once back. That also was false. So the idea is that life is messy. We can never predict the journey we're going to be taking. And so to tell our children, you know what? The first truth is that it's OK not to be OK. We should, as a society, but also as parents, remove the shame or remove any stigma around uh, feelings of sadness or depression or a sense of, you know, having going through tough times, it all happens. And so we need to give permission to our kids to know you're okay who you are. Just because you got a B minus on your chemistry test doesn't mean I love you less. Just because you didn't get into the college of your choice that we were hoping to, you're still okay. We love you who you are. It all works out. I said this to the faculty earlier on. Trust me, at the end of your life, if you're a kid right now in high school or college, you're not going to be stressing about the B minus you got in your chemistry class. It's not going to matter. So just focus on, no, it's OK not to be OK. And this allows children to go into the world and face challenges and know that they, can, they have permission to fail. It's OK. It's totally OK. The next idea is that the first R, I talk about these three R's, three R's of parenting, the, the new three R's of learning. Those three R's, readiness, reflection, or probably readiness, resilience, and reflection. The first R, readiness. This is where I'm going to share with you some brain science research which, is, which has come out in just the past few years. There is a remarkable feature or function about the human brain that was just discovered in the past 20 or 30 years. We have found out the human brain, my brain, your brain, is not fixed. When I say it's not fixed, it, it, the brain can develop until the age of 25. But you heard that, old, that you, you've, you've heard, heard that old phrase, and you can't teach an old dog new tricks. That's not true. You can. Your brain can rewire itself. There's a concept called neuroplasticity. Anyone, anyone heard of that idea before? Oh, wow, quite a few of you have. This idea of neuroplasticity is that you can rewire and retrain your brain to overcome negative thinking. So if you're a parent and your child is struggling through school or going through maybe a bad time or not feeling like he or she is good enough, remind them that you can change this behavior. As I say to my students, you are not defined by the drama of the day. What's going on for you right now isn't going to define you who you are in one year, five years, 20 years, 
50 years later. It is just happening right now. And so one powerful concept of neuroplasticity we're finding is that imagine like you're walking here in the woods, you know, the forest here in Aspen. There's this trail. And so what makes a trail so easy to traverse is because more people have walked on it, right? But let's say you want to forge a new path, a new trail in, in, in the forest. Well, it's going to be difficult at first to, you know, to, to maybe traverse this new trail. But after a while, it becomes more um, uh, easy to, to access. This is a good analogy for the brain. So if you tell yourself or your child is, is, is thinking to himself or herself, well, I really suck at algebra, you know, or, you know, I just, I just want to be happy. You can actually remind your kids, you can actually change this behavior. And so one thing I talk about in the book, Science of a Happy Brain, is that um, we can begin to shift our thoughts. There's a, there's a concept I'll talk about a little bit later called cognitive reframing that allows you to bypass the negative thinking. So you have to revert back to the old patterns of behavior. So telling our kids or telling our children that you are ready, you, you, can, you can train your brain to be ready for future challenges. This is gonna be very key. And so I know we talked about earlier with Megan for the C learning uh, here at the high school, but one of, the, one of the, the areas of research I study about the brain is how contemplative practices such as meditation or art or creativity or prayer or even uh, volunteer work or, or compassion work literally begins to rewire the brain. And so we're discovering that if you can allow your child to, to, um, uh, to understand that what he or she is experiencing in the moment doesn't define who they're going to be later on, that you can change its behavior, this is gonna be key to help them become ready for a future that we sometimes have not always have control over. So moving on, falsehood number two. I was always told that having any setbacks or adversity in your life, you know, try to avoid it as much as possible. So this is something we also have to, as parents or educators, have to understand that the second falsehood is that setbacks and adversity are, in a, we can't avoid them, they're unavoidable. And so I always make the, the nice analogy, all of you drive cars, I'm assuming you do, and all of you know about your car's suspension system. Imagine if your car suspension system is not properly working. So you run over, you, you drive over you know, like a, a pothole or a stone, it feels like the whole car is just shaking, you're just rattling like that. So one thing we're finding in the research, or my brain science research, is that we need to actually understand adversity and strife can build character. Raise your hand if you've ever broken a bone in your body, anyone here? Okay, if you have, you might not know this, but when you break a bone, when that bone heals, it becomes stronger. How many of you have ever had the flu? Yeah, probably pretty much everyone, right? Um, you, your body builds an immunity or builds resistance to that virus in the future. This is a biological adaptation of, of survival. We know that anything that happens in the human body, whether breaking a bone or having, the, having a, a virus or a flu, your body naturally will build up a resistance to it. Well, guess what? We're discovering the same thing actually happens in the brain when you are exposed at a young age to, you know, to, to, to manageable adversity and trauma. We're not talking here about major trauma, like you know, a child being, you know, like a, growing up in a, in a war zone. We're talking about, you know, maybe you got an F in your, on one of your exams, or maybe you got into trouble by doing something it wasn't so good, and maybe set you back a little bit. And understand that these negative situations or these adversities ultimately can build character. They can help you achieve that sense of resilience, which I'll talk about very shortly. So it's almost like the sense of, we need to tell our kids how to strengthen 
their own internal suspension system, those shock absorbers. So every little calamity, like, you know, I, 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 my, my friends are all going to this party, but I'm sick, my life sucks, or like, you know, the guy you want to ask out to prom says no. All these things are just small little things. They're not the end of the world. So helping our, our children distinguish between real emergency, not an emergency. But here is the catch. This is where brain science research really, I think, will, will, will shed some light on this. I talked to you earlier about, the neuro, about neuroplasticity. There is sadly a very unfortunate um, aspect about how our brains developed. And this is called the neg your brain's negativity bias. So I like to say it. Your brain is like Velcro for negative experiences. Your brain is like Teflon for positive ones. Negative experiences stick and are wired more strongly into your brain than positive ones. Why on earth would that be the case? It all goes back to survival. Imagine yourself going back 10,000 years ago to the age of our Stone Age tribe ancestors, and you, there were two options. Thinking there was a lion in the bush, and there wasn't one, or thinking there was no lion in the bush, and there was one. The second one meant you'd be lunch. The first is you got to eat lunch the next day. So survival is the key. Survival gets more of us to survive, more of us survive, more offspring, more perpetuity of the species. The problem, though, negative with the negativity bias, is that our brains are more uh, um, adapt or sculpted to be driven by the anxiety, to be driven by the, that sense of stress, because this got us to survive. So our brain, unfortunately, is wired and evolved in such a way to remember threats from our past to be suspicious of present threats and to anticipate future threats. The problem is we sometimes don't know the distinguishing, distinguishing what's real and what's not real. So a good example for me, getting here to Aspen from Chicago, I barely made the check-in for my flight. You know, have you, have you, you gotta check your bag in by a certain time, otherwise the, the, you, you can't you know, get your bag checked in. Made it within one minute. I was panicking, but the same stress response system, you know, like my heart was racing, and my, you know, I'm kind of like, you know, uh, I'm breathing really rapidly and things. That's the exact same response my brain has if I'm being chased by a bear. So the problem is we can't distinguish between what is a real threat, what is a perceived threat. I'm not gonna die if I miss my flight. I can always catch other flight inconvenience, Lexi might be a little upset, but, but she'd get over it. But the idea is that it's not a life threat situation. So helping our kids understand that it's important to distinguish between what is a real threat or a real emergency, what's not an emergency. And it starts with us. Sometimes if we get, you know, like amped up about as parents or educators, if we can begin to catch ourselves and say, you know what, this is gonna be okay, the brains of children are like sponges. They absorb and they take in anything that they see in their environment. So if they see you being calm, you being kind of composed, it gives them a better sense of, you know what, mom and dad are pretty chill in adversity. I can be the same way as well. But there's something about the negativity bias I also want to share with you. And this is the idea of Resilience, the second R. The second R of the three R's, resilience. What is resilience? Well, resilience is the opposite of fragility. How I like to see it. And we can train children to become resilient. And here's one way we can do this. I said about the brain's negativity bias. What we're finding in the brain science research, it takes a minimum of five positive behaviors or thoughts to outweigh one negative one. It is not the promise of happiness, it is the practice of happiness. Very important. 
like anything we want to experience or uh, achieve in our life, whether you know learning how to play the piano, speaking French, uh, quit smoking, it takes discipline, it takes practice. So learning to be resilient or teaching our children to be resilient takes practice. And so one way we can do this, and we talk more about this maybe the Q&A, one thing I talk about in the book and also in the happiness course that I teach at Chapman University is remembering to be grateful. We all, about, we all talk, heard about gratitude. This is not just some like wishful thinking. It is real empirical brain science research. They've done studies have shown if you can focus on at least three to five aspects of your life that you are grateful for and just be mindful of that, it will help you overcome some of the negative. I'll give you a special trick that I do. I actually, believe it or not, have a post-it on my bathroom mirror that reminds me of five things about my life that I'm grateful for. And so in a matter from having a really you know, awful day, things are not going well, it's almost the first thing and the last thing that I see is like those five things. If you don't want to do that, put it on your smartphone. Have it be like somewhere, somewhere you can just see easily and visibly. Because as I mentioned, your brain is more predisposition, disposition, predispos, predispositioned to focus on the negative. We have to work on the positive. It doesn't come naturally. It takes practice. So this idea is that when we, when, when we can begin to that cognitive reframing I mentioned earlier, the cognitive reframing is being able to reframe and re, uh, you know, almost like re, uh, reshape the experiences into something positive. So let me share with you again my personal example. Um, in the aftermath of my mother's death, I experienced what would undeniably be called a very difficult time in my life. It's almost the, the same time in my life where Lexi's book came very powerful um, support for me. And what I found for myself is that I was not, I chose not to become imprisoned or to become hijacked by this situation. Flash forward 20 years later, look where I am right now. I learned how to take this negative experience, experience and turn it into something valuable to teach to, to others in the world. So this is something we can teach our kids as well. Sometimes we just don't know where our life leads or where, how it unfolds. One thing that might appear maybe uh, unfortunate in the present moment, in the future, can be something that actually gives you your greater sense of purpose and a sense of meaning. So the last falsehood, it's all about my happiness. Something we have to remind our kids, it's not all about you. Even though you're teenagers, or maybe your kids might think, you know, I'm the center of the, the universe, or the universe revolves around me, there is no you without community and without your family and without relationships. We're finding in the research, say we, myself and other researchers, so I'm not just the only person doing this research, obviously, but one thing that we find is that the, the sense of individualism, the sense of me, me, the me, 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 me culture, the me, 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 me upbringing that we sometimes maybe uh, give to our kids or maybe tell our kids, and the sense of competition, like I got to be the best at this or I got to outperform my friend on this because it's, it's all about struggle and survival. But it's not. The truth really is, is that there is no me without relationships and community. I want to share with you what is, in my opinion, the most powerful um, discovery to be made about the brain in the past 50 years, probably ever. We've always thought about the brain being a cognitive organ, a thinking organ, a rational organ, perhaps even an emotional organ. We've discovered something about the human brain that actually is even far more primal and more fundamental. My brain, your brain, the brain of every single person that you know has evolved as a social organ.
the human brain is fundamentally a social organ that is driven by community, for tribe, for belonging and connection. Why would that be the case? Okay, here let me tell you why. We humans are not the fastest of animals. We're not the strongest. We can't swim underwater, we can't fly, but what is it that made humans the most dominant species on the planet? And what that is, what that one feature is, humans excelled at one feature more so than any other species. And that is our powerful ability to form complex social networks. To socialize is to survive, to tribe is to thrive. Another way to look at it, picture yourself back 10,000 years ago to the age of your tribal ancestors, your Stone Age tribe, cave people dwellers. You're all by yourself. You're wandering around the wild savannas of ancient earth. It's cold, you haven't eaten in three days, you're pretty tired, and all you want is just a safe cave, some food, and maybe a good night's sleep for one night, just to make it one more day. You know, and, and happiness in, to, the, to, our, to our ancestors was just living one more day. Raise your hand if you believe that your chances for survival would increase if you had one other able-bodied person with you you trust. Raise your hand. Yes, yes. Imagine you had five other people, 10, 50, 100. This is the power of tribe. So an experiment was done at UCLA in 2003. What they did is they put volunteers into an fMRI machine, which is a functional magnetic resonance imaging machine, which can, looks at what's going on in your brain in real time. So, and one thing, so in this experiment, what they did, they put people into fMRI machines, and there was a blank video on top of the, you know, on the, on the top part of the fMRI machine. And these volunteers were playing a virtual reality game. In this virtual game, they were uh, playing, there, a ball was being passed back and forth between the person in the FR machine and supposedly other people who were playing this game. But of course, it was a controlled experiment. So after maybe five, 10 minutes of you know, people being, have the ball passed to them, all of a sudden it stopped. They weren't getting the ball passed to them. So they wanted to, to see and observe what happens in the human brain when people experience social rejection? What happens in the human brain when you experience a sense of social pain? And what they found just blew, excuse the expression, blew the minds of the neuroscientists. What they found is this. The same region of your brain that experiences the pain of social rejection, say you, know, you, uh, you lose uh, a loved one, you get fired from your job, you get maybe uh, dumped by your partner, whatever the case might be. The same region of your brain that experiences social pain overlaps the same region of your brain that experiences physical pain. Your brain experiences the pain from a broken bone and a broken bond in the exact same way. Even more powerful, your brain naturally produces opioids, which are a way to, mit to, to diminish the, 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 the experience of pain. Now obviously you, you, you know that the pain from experiencing uh, perhaps the loss of a loved one isn't quite as acute as maybe the pain when you say, um, you know, break your leg, but the same regions of the brain fire. But what they also found is that the region of your brain that regulates physical pain, say you break your bone, you break your toe, you, you know, you hit your thumb, you, when you're hammering a nail, you hit your thumb on the hammer, the same part of your brain that tries to regulate or dampen that physical pain is the same region of the brain 
that tries to dampen social pain as well. Pain is all the same in your brain. Physical pain, emotional pain, psychological pain, social pain. Why would your brain do this? Why would your brain um, create a functional strategy that allows for you to process and regulate social pain in the same way as physical pain? The answer is the human brain understood the power of socialization as a strategy for survival. Any functional strategy that allowed the lesser species, the human species, to survive. So opposable thumbs, walking upright, vocal cords. These are all functional strategies that allow for humans to survive in a very harsh terrain. Socialization is the same way. And so every one of you who is alive today has in your genes the powerful drive, biological evolutionary, evolutionary drive for social connection. Why am I saying all this? Is because in the lack of having strong social support systems, we're finding the brain dysregulates. We're finding that people who actually lack having strong social support systems have a 50% greater chance for, more, for, for, for death or morbidity or disease, more so than smoking, obesity, lack of sleep, or I think, so those, all those three combined. This is powerful. So why am I saying this in the context of this third R, which is uh, uh, there is no me without relationships? We need to recognize as, especially for our children, to help them understand they're part of something larger, to help them understand they're interconnected. They have something to contribute to the world. And so, you know, I'd like to say, it doesn't matter if your child goes on to become a cashier at Walmart um, or the CEO of the next Apple, you know, or big tech company, or, or, or goes in to join the military, or becomes a truck driver, or becomes a nurse, or an ER doctor. Every single person has a valuable function in society. And so when we teach our kids, it doesn't matter what you do, just do it joyfully. Just do it as best as you can. You matter, you value, you add contribution into the world. And this sense of connectedness, this sense of belonging is so crucial. I know we talked about this earlier to the, the faculty who, was here, who were here earlier. I, like many probably parents in this room, educators, um, we have a love-hate relationship with technology. Especially when our kids use it. Um, we're finding that one powerful factor, one contributing factor, not the, not the primary, one leading factor into perhaps the rise of depression and suicide rates that are taking place in the past decade, one powerful factor could be the, the rise in technological digital dependency. As I like to say, anything you can carry with you is a weapon for addiction. Cell phones, smartphones are one of this. So I talk about this in the book, but one thing I want to say is technology can connect us, but let's also be aware technology makes us disconnected in an overconnected world. We need to find those connections in real time, the authentic physical connections we have. So one thing we can do, and hopefully as parents, maybe you can try this. How about, because we're in a new year, how about we actually can maybe, uh, we can maybe make a very powerful request to our children, no technology at the dinner table at least one night a week, nothing. And it includes parents too. So you have your cell phones off, you have them put away. Because when children see, wait a minute, mom and dad are on their cell phones, like why can't I be on my cell phone? So you are participating in this. Why I'm saying this is because it is this idea, again, of social connection. 
It's not just digital connection, it's real-time connection. So what this does, I feel, it builds this sense of the third, I would call reflection. Understanding our connection to the world and our function and our purpose in it, it gives our children a deeper sense of identity, a deeper sense of meaning, a deeper, a deeper sense of ethical and moral in uh, uh, our place in the world. And most importantly, this idea of reflection, it allows children to remember, I got here because there were a group of people who cared about me. My parents, my teachers, my friends, my family. I got here because there was a tribe that made me thrive. And so these three R's of, edu these three R's of parenting, training or maybe uh, uh, instilling the principles, the new three R's, to help our children become ready, resilient, and reflective are key. And one thing I'll say before I kind of maybe end, we'll have, we'll have plenty of time for Q&A, so please, I hope you do ask questions, is the very powerful idea that happy brains make happy people, happy people make a happy world, it all starts with you. So every single one of you has the ability to make the world a happier place. It all starts with you. And so perhaps one way I'd like to maybe end for today, and we can talk more about this uh, in our Q&A, is maybe my personal blessing to you. This is my wish for all of you. Never be afraid to let your light shine forth fully and brightly because the world would be a much dimmer place without you in it. So with that, I thank you all for being here. I am I'm just delighted that we could have this opportunity to be here. Thank you, Theron. Thank you, Lexi. And thank you all.